Mr. Secretary, if you're ready, we'll dive right in. Let's go for it. <laughs> it's good to be back here with you. Thank you. You know, President Biden is with the leaders of some of the largest democratic economies in the world, the G7 in Asia. But as the New York Times put it right now, the major potential threat to global economic stability is the United States. How damaging do you think this domestic dysfunction is with the debt ceiling standoff? I think it's a real problem. Um, it, it feeds the narrative from China in particular <clears throat> that our system doesn't work, uh, that it's broken, it's paralyzed, it can't get things done, um, that, that their model is more stable and, and actually more effective than ours. So, so sort of having these uh, episodes of great crisis and then some solution at the last second uh, really feeds a notion uh, that, that the U.S. political system uh, isn't working at all. Do you think it is working? Not very well. You know, I mean, the truth is in the last year or so, some fairly, fairly major legislation got passed, some of it with bipartisan support. And so they're, they're is the possibility of some things being done, but on something like the debt ceiling and, and so on, uh, the inability to get some of these big things done, I think is a real problem. What do you think the biggest threat to the United States is right now? I think it is the polarization in the country. And, and you know, we've always had polarization in America. The, if you go back to the Jefferson Adams presidential race in 1800, the things that were said in that election would fit right into a current political environment. But what's been different uh, more recently is not just uh, a measure of paralysis as indicated by the debt ceiling, but a level of meanness uh, and a lack of civility among our politicians. Our, the, the sense that somebody who disagrees with you is not just somebody you disagree with, but is an enemy, is, mm -hmm. is a bad person. This lack of civility is, is I think, something new and, and really is pretty pervasive in the Congress and it sets a pretty bad example for the rest of the country. I, I mean, I think a lot of people listening would agree with you on that, but the solution doesn't seem clear. How do you change that? Well, I think it starts with, uh, with leaders, and, and you don't have to demonize people uh, to disagree with them. Uh, you can say, you know, my opponent has a different point of view. I totally disagree. I think that that would be a terrible mistake, but I also believe that he or she also is trying to do what he thinks, he or she thinks is best for America. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple, actually. It's just, it's just treating each other with... Uh, more civility and, and, the, and the reality that as Americans, we're all in this together. And it doesn't matter whether you're from a red state or a blue state, whatever happens to the country happens to everybody. Agreed. Um, you recently wrote a letter along with other former defense secretaries to Senate leaders criticizing Tommy Tuberville, the Republican senator for placing a hold on senior military promotions until the Pentagon reverses its policy in regard to covering expenses for service members who travel to have abortions. What do you think the impact is of that hold? I think there are several impacts. One is that there is criticism <clears throat> in some circles that the military is becoming politicized. Mm -hmm. Doing this further politicizes the military. It makes the military a pawn in what is otherwise civilian political debates. And, and so that's one uh, consequence. The other consequence is the one pointed out by Secretary Austin and uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and others, and that is the impact on the chain of command, on, on having an orderly process of succession in command positions that really matter. It's We've like got, 200 positions. Well, it's 200, it'll be 650 by the end of the year. Um, but it's, it's significant command positions. You're gonna have a significant turnover in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. All those positions are being held up. If they're, this is a civilian political debate and it ought to be settled in the political arena, uh, not by holding hostage 
career military officers. The senator argues it's a matter of principle that abortion shouldn't be in any way federally subsidized. That's a that's a, f a fair point for him to make, but it ought to be resolved in the political process uh, in the Congress uh, and and not uh, in the Pentagon. Um, well, we'll watch how that gets resolved. But to your point about um, broader military readiness and, and the environment we're in, you know, President Biden's decision to go to Asia was partly also to show some muscle flexing to China. And he cut short that trip because of what's happening here at home. Do you see that failure to follow through as having a broader impact? Clearly, it's had a negative impact in Papua New Guinea, which he was supposed to visit, be the first president to visit one of the Pacific Islands like that. He was supposed to visit Australia, and the Australian press is really critical of, mm -hmm. of uh, not being able to have the visit. So this domestic crisis, frankly, I think he's, he's right to understand that he needs to be in Washington to get this crisis resolved. But it is an example of where this debt crisis has foreign policy and national security implications. Um, we're now over two years into the Biden administration, and no cabinet member has traveled to China to date. There are some signs that there may be a bit of a thaw coming here. But the two presidents need to talk. What has to happen before they can get on the phone to each other? Well, I was encouraged by the, the day-long talks that the National Security Advisor had with his Chinese counterpart a week or so ago in Vienna. Uh, our ambassador, Nick Burns, is now being allowed to see some more senior officials than he's been uh, able to see in the past. But this, this lack of communication is a real problem. You know, even in the worst days of the Cold War, uh, we had the hotline uh, with, the, with the Soviets and, and, and then even in the 90s with the Russians. We had agreements on how to deal with incidents like incidents at sea and how to make sure they didn't escalate and get out of control. We don't have any of those kinds of communications with the Chinese today. So my highest priority, frankly, would be uh, direct communications link between our commanders in uh, Hawaii and the Chinese commanders in eastern China. So given all of the military activities in the South China Sea and the, and the Taiwan Strait. But it's also important for the leaders to talk and to begin to figure out, you know, we are going to be in this contest for a long time and let's just face that reality. And how do we keep it from becoming a military confrontation? How do we limit this to an economic, political, technological contest and avoid a catastrophic conflict between these two countries. You say limit it to economic and technological competition. I mean, that, that seems pretty head on right now. Uh, recently, Beijing reportedly appointed their state security czar to start cracking down on US firms that do business in China. Um, it's, getting, it's getting tough it is on tough. that front. And, and what Xi Jinping made very clear at the Party Congress uh, a few months ago was that security was going to trump the economy in China. Isn't that incredible? Well, for him, it's all about the power, maintaining and sustaining the power of the Communist Party of China. And that's his highest priority, and he is willing to sacrifice economic growth for that. And that has so many implications Absolutely. if he's willing to put the economy second to state security. I mean, that doesn't necessarily seem the most rational choice for the betterment of the people. Well, I don't think the betterment of the people has ever been the highest priority of the Chinese Communist Party. But the policies that they followed until Xi Jinping came along actually did improve the quality right. of life of the Chinese people. They brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But basically, he is saying now the security is more important. And obviously, he, he wants and will, and will do what he can to get economic growth, <clears throat> because that's really the sole source of legitimacy for the party among the people today. Mm -hmm. but, but on the margins, and maybe even on core issues, they're willing to sacrifice economic growth uh, for control.
And we see now the Commerce Secretary from the U.S. is expected to meet with her Chinese counterpart in Washington, not on Chinese soil, but here. There's the start of some kind of potential opening. But you also have the Biden administration saying they're going to put that national security lens on Chinese investment in the United States and start tightening that. What do you think of what the administration has done to date and how dangerous is it to start putting limits on U.S. investment in China? Sure. Well, first of all, I think that uh, you know, the, the political rhetoric is one thing. The economic reality is another. And the trade between the United States and China last year was the biggest in history ever, despite what the politicians say. So the notion of completely decoupling these two economies, or China from the rest of the global economy, is completely unrealistic. So I actually think the administration's uh, adoption of the European phrase of de-risking the economic relationship makes a lot of sense. And what, and what National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan talks about is very high fences around a very small yard. So mm -hmm. you identify, and this is basically the approach we took with the Soviet Union, ultimately. You identify those technologies that could significantly advance their national security strength uh, and their military power, and you are very tough on investment uh, on, from them or our investment going there or on uh, exports in, of those kinds of technologies to China. You're very tough on those, but then you have these concentric circles where you have recognized that there's an economic relationship that actually makes sense and benefits both countries. So I think the approach of, of and I used this phrase back in the Cold War, was um, high fences around small yards. And, and I think that's the right approach. Also, frankly, from the standpoint, speaking of an old intelligence guy, that's, that enables you actually to monitor more carefully what's actually going and, what, uh, and, and to make sure that you can enforce the rules that you're putting in place. If you have 2,000 items, 2,000 kinds of technology on, on the list, that's impossible to monitor on a global basis. But if it's, if it's a, a significantly smaller number, but very important technologies, then you're in a much better position to actually enforce the restrictions that you want. Um, on the more sort of conventional clash, the one you say we need to avoid, a military one, um, President Biden told 60 Minutes that he would send U.S. troops to defend Taiwan in the event of Chinese aggression. For years, the policy has been arming the Taiwanese to defend themselves. Is that too outdated of a policy? Does it need to be more muscular like Biden articulated? Well, what's interesting to me is I think the president has now made that quote unquote slip four times. <laughs> and each time, the White House uh, spokesmen and, and staff have walked that back that our policy of strategic ambiguity uh, hasn't changed. I think that the most important thing is less what you call our strategy than what we do. And the important thing is to strengthen our military presence in the region so that it sends a signal to the Chinese that no matter what the circumstances, any effort to try and take Taiwan by force would, would result in a defeat, a significant defeat for China. So building up Taiwan's strength, military strength, building up our own deterrent uh, capability out there is important. I think, I think strategic ambiguity, if you will, preserves a greater freedom of action for the United States. Do we really want to commit in advance that we will go to war with China what if, what if the uh, Taiwanese down the road were to declare independence unilaterally? That's, that's opposed to our policy. We're against that. We've been against that ever since the normalization of relations. Mm -hmm. We've been telling Taiwan, don't do anything that would uh, imply you're moving in the direction of independence. So I don't see a reason to, to uh, tie our hands, if you will, but it has to be against the backdrop of a significant increase in our military power out there as a de deterrent to China. Japan's prime minister said Ukraine today may be East Asia tomorrow. It seems to be there's this increased reference to Taiwan or some kind of military expansion by China as looming 
as almost inevitable. Um, do you see the potential for a head-to-head -head clash here? Or are we thinking of it in incorrectly? Well, there's always that potential. I mean, the Chinese have, uh, have been building ships like crazy. They now have more ships in the Pacific than we do. Um, and, and they're still building. Um, they are building uh, naval bases in places like Djibouti and looking for them in Pakistan and Sri Lanka and Cambodia and elsewhere. So they are looking to increase the ability of their Blue Water Navy to operate on a global basis. There are mm -hmm. even reports that they're looking for a facility on the west coast of Africa. So the Chinese military buildup is a very real thing, and their investment is, is, a, is a very significant one. And it began well before Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we have to take it very seriously, and I think, I think the disparity in the size of our navies, even though our ships may be bigger and better technologically, at a certain point, the numbers really matter. Um, at a time we're talking about cutting spending, potentially, what you're talking about is a huge investment in the defense space. Well, um, don't get me started on Congress and the budget. I mean, the fact is, right now, the Pentagon is operating under a continuing resolution. Right. They have had continuing resolutions like 15 out of the last 16 years. The Congress failing to have an appropriated budget for the Defense Department at the beginning of the fiscal year. We're, we're halfway through the fiscal year, more than halfway through the fiscal year now. What that means is they can't start anything new. They can't significantly increase the size of programs or buys. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at a, at a time when so many in Congress are talking about the importance of, of, of our military strength and they're, and they're talking about buying more and adding more to the budget, they have put impediments in place that make it almost impossible for us to do that in any sensible way. They, they have all of these rules and all these things that they talk about with acquisition reform and mm -hmm. procurement reform and so on. But when you have a continuing resolution, what's the point right. of any reform? So unless they can get the budget fixed so that the money that they appropriate actually can be spent, um, our ability to compete with China is really, is really hampered. Well, part of that's being negotiated now alongside the debt ceiling, the budget. We'll see where we'll it ends see. up. <laughs> um, you famously said that Joe Biden was wrong in foreign policy for 40 years. And I know you get asked about this all the time. But at this point in his presidency, how do you assess his performance? Well, first of all, on the thing that's most important right now, which is Ukraine, I think that the way the administration used intelligence to alert the Europeans and others to what the Russians were about to do was very important. And I think the way that, that uh, the administration was able to assemble the alliance, bring the alliance together in support of Ukraine has been very impressive. My problem is that, that they have been, I think, uh, slow in approving um, the various kinds of weapon systems going uh, to the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, there's a debate for a long time. Do we send tanks? Well, finally we sent tanks. Do we send things like the HIMARS and other kinds of uh, capabilities? And we finally did it, but only after months and months of indecision. So they've been, worrying, they've been worrying about, talking about F-16s for many, many months, and now we hear, well, we're going to go ahead and allow the training on the F-16s. Well, that's a decision that could have been made six months ago. Truth is, if they had begun training pilots on F-16s six months ago, then those pilots would be able to get into those airplanes this spring. Mm -hmm. So I, it's the delays in the decision-making process and in getting the, and in finally approving the weapons for, for Ukraine. I understand the need to avoid a direct confrontation with the Russians, but we, I think we learned pretty early on that as long as we weren't providing things that could attack Russia proper, that Putin was not going to retaliate. Well, wow. there was just this report, the Ukrainians and then US officials confirmed that it was a US Patriot missile system that shot down some Russian jets Correct. over Russian airspace. That's that, significant. 
yes. But, you know, if they launch it from Russian airspace, then they have to be prepared to have the remains fall on Russian, uh, on the Russian territory. Mm -hmm. But things like that start to raise questions about, you know, the weaponry being provided and escalation. You don't see that as I'm, I'm crossing the line. Given the nature of the weapons that have been provided, and I think you can have agreements with the Ukrainians about the kinds of things you're going to attack. For example, the British are now providing some longer range mm -hmm. missiles. And they're, they're saying to the Ukrainians, yeah, if you want to use these on any target in your territory, which includes Crimea, go ahead. But they're not saying, go ahead and use these to attack targets deep inside Russia. Um, a year ago when we spoke, you told me the one glimmer of hope you saw was that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin had united Democrats and Republicans in Washington. Um, there was strong consensus. Do you actually think that's holding? I do. I think that, uh, in fact, there's kind of a competition on the Hill to see who can be tougher on China. And, and it makes a more nuanced policy by the administration more difficult because anything that the administration does to try and put a floor on this relationship gets criticized on the Hill as conceding something mm -hmm. uh, to the Chinese. But I think by and large, the, there is very broad bipartisan support for uh, what the US is doing for Ukrainians. And I think it's all, uh, also uh, in terms of China. Yet there are some loud voices raising concerns about U.S. military readiness in terms of drawing down, in particular, U.S. stockpiles to quickly provide arms to Ukraine or to Taiwan, and the connection to this concept that, that weakens the United States. Um, Donald Trump said last week, we're giving away so much equipment, we don't have ammunition for ourselves right now, we're giving away too much. Well, I think you have to look at the kinds of things that we're providing and in, in, in many respects the kinds of equipment we're giving the Ukrainians for this ground war against Russia are not necessarily the kinds of weapons we would rely on if we ended up in a confrontation, for example, with China. Uh, I think there also is a realization that we have let our uh, production capabilities wither uh, since the end of the Cold War, and finally people are getting behind the notion we're going to have to make some long-term investments there. I also think that the military, and one of the reasons for the hesitancy probably in terms of some of these weapon systems, is that the military is watching very carefully to make sure we don't draw down our stockpiles in some of these weapons too far. Mm -hmm. And I think they're monitoring that on a very, uh, very closely. So somewhat of a legitimate concern, but more nuanced, you would say, than just yes. ammunition. Yes. Um, but there is arguments, there are arguments being made by Republican senators, I think of Josh Hawley, for example, um, who said it, it's hard for the US essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but to do two things at once. That um, by staying focused on Ukraine, that in some way it's a benefit to Xi Jinping's um, ambitions elsewhere on the planet. That if you look one place, you can't be as robust in the other. Do you think that question of being overstretched is worth a conversation. I don't think that's the case. Because uh, the last few administrations brought that up in reference to Afghanistan. I think, I think that um, we're, we're not overstretched. We're, first of all, uh, it's equipment we're providing to Ukrainians, not troops, uh, so that there is no drawdown of American forces, uh, as there was in Iraq mm -hmm. and Afghanistan, of dramatically large numbers of American troops on the ground. Second, I think it's really important to understand that a weakening, I think getting this right is important, weakening what we're doing in Ukraine actually creates greater danger for Taiwan. If the Chinese believe we can out, be outlasted, if the Chinese believe that we can that we can be forced out of Ukraine by our domestic divisions mm -hmm. uh, and stop helping Ukraine. I don't know, understand how anybody thinks that strengthens our position vis-a-vis -vis China when it comes to Taiwan. Uh, the reality is, and most, a lot of the critics of, of our support for Ukraine make the point also separately that the 
catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan had a huge impact on Russia and China and everybody else. Well, if that's the case, then what is the impact of pulling back in Ukraine, mm -hmm. where the stakes are even larger than they were uh, in, in Afghanistan? So I think showing strength and resistance to the Russians in Ukraine actually strengthens our position in terms of support for Taiwan and in deterring China. I think there is an interesting conversation, though, about America's role in the world. And we're seeing some of the Republican candidates in particular take some pretty different positions on this. Um, you had Governor DeSantis say Ukraine was a territorial dispute, not necessarily core to US interests at all. Uh, Donald Trump won't say he wants Ukraine to win or call Vladimir Putin a warlord or a war criminal. And those two men are the front runners. And then over on the other part of the Republican ticket, you have a Mike Pence or you have a Nikki Haley who talk about this fight in Europe and winning it as necessary to deterring Xi Jinping in Asia. Do you think where a candidate stands on this issue of Russia and Ukraine really should matter to people at home? Like, what does it say about the candidates? Well, I think it should matter. I think it's very important where a, where a candidate stands on issues related to core national security interests. And because you believe Ukraine is core to U.S. national security absolutely. interests. Absolutely, because if, if we have these NATO obligations, if, if Vladimir Putin wins in Ukraine, there's no doubt in my mind <clears throat> that Moldova is next, mm -hmm. that Belarus will be incorporated into the original Russian empire, which is what Putin's trying to recreate. And it creates great danger to the Baltic states and to Poland, where we have treaty alliances that would require American forces uh, to confront the Russians. So I think, I think this is important. And there are differences of view. Uh, and frankly, there are some differences of view on these issues in the Democratic Party as well. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think what that puts a premium on is, is the leaders, from the president to the congressional leaders, um, for explaining why what we're doing is in America's interest, yeah. why this is important. And I think this is a continuing need for education and explanation to, to the American people. Of why are we doing this? Why does this really matter? And I, I think, frankly, that neither party has done a very, that leaders in neither party have done a very good job of, of uh, explaining that, and, and particularly the focus on our interests. Right. And, and I take your point on both parties. There's often this, it's either existential or it's um, at the cost of something domestic, yeah. right? That somehow arming Ukraine takes away from the potential to invest at home. Um, that argument is made in both parties. When you look at someone like Ron DeSantis, um, he has said you know, that the US, when you talked at the Bush administration, had a messianic impulse, talking about promoting democracy around the world. They didn't have a clear-eyed view of American interests. Narrowing the definition of American interests seems to be kind of at the core of this debate within Republican circles right now. Some would call it Jacksonian worldview. Just what do we get? Sure. I think, I think my own view is that, that we, um, in some cases, were too ambitious in our aspirations uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I, it was clearly important that we uh, take out the Taliban after 9-11. Uh, I th I've written, I think we should have, in 2002, basically pulled back mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. So I think, I think that the, the, the challenge is that in trying to uh, make these countries better, we got involved in nation building that was beyond the time limits uh, that an administration was going to have and beyond the resources that America should actually invest in trying to make those things happen. So I think, I think I come back to what's a what's a realist view of our of our actual national interest, and that's where we ought to place our bets, mm -hmm. uh, because that's also I think where you can rally significant support on the part of the American people.
Um, on the issue of Ukraine, uh, the Director of National Intelligence of Real Haynes testified that the U.S. assessment is that Vladimir Putin is, quote, very unlikely to use a tactical nuclear weapon. But the bravado continues. Um, do you still have concern that this could escalate? Or are we entering this sort of slow grinding war of attrition? Well, I think that the chances of Putin using a tactical nuclear weapon are not zero, but they're very, very low. First of all, there's no military value in it. The way the war is, uh, the way the troops are dispersed and so on, a tactical nuclear weapon has only a very limited and localized impact. But the opprobrium that would fall on the Soviet, on Russia, for using a, t a tactical nuclear weapon, uh, countries like India and others that have kind of been on the fence would get off that fence immediately. And, and the potential for NATO's retaliation, NATO wouldn't retaliate with a tactical nuclear weapon, but it would engage Russia much more directly, I think, if there were the use of a tactical nuclear weapon. He also has his partner without limits, Xi Jinping, twice publicly telling him not to use tactical nuclear weapons. So mm -hmm. there's just, there's no, there's no money in it for Putin. Uh, and I think his ability to escalate is, is pretty limited. I mean, the, the Russians have pretty much thrown what they've got into this fight in Ukraine now. Maybe they could undertake some kind of sabotage or other kinds of actions in Western Europe uh, and so on. I suppose those, those are options. But they all have similar risks for Russia. So I think that the risk of, of, uh, of a significant escalation on the part of the Russians is pretty limited at this point. But not necessarily at a point where we're tipping towards negotiation. No. And I think, I think first of all, the, the, a negotiation will depend on the situation on the ground. And, and it remains to be seen what this Ukrainian counteroffensive, um, when it will start and what it will accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, I personally think that negotiations are pretty far in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this fight will continue in particular. I mean, either way, if the counteroffensive is really successful or if it's not, the fighting will continue mm -hmm. and until um, one side or the other is exhausted. And, and, and Putin's bet is that he can outlast the Ukrainians, outlast the Europeans, and outlast us. And Xi Jinping is watching this very carefully. So this is another reason, I think, for us to stay the course in supporting, in supporting the Ukrainians. At some point, there may be a, uh, a willingness to, in effect, freeze the conflict and have some sort of, I think, I think the idea of a peace treaty or of a permanent solution, if you will, is very unlikely. What you might have is a situation where the Ukrainians uh, have recaptured much of their territory, although mm -hmm. not all, and, and the Russians are willing to settle for holding on to some piece of eastern Ukraine and, and things stop. And then you probably have a situation that looks a lot like what we saw between 2014 and 2022, between the invasion of eastern Ukraine and Crimea in 2014 and the all-out invasion. And under those circumstances, that's the point at which I think NATO and the Western uh, countries, the, led by the United States, have to decide what kind of long-term security assurances are we prepared to give to Ukraine to make sure that Putin or his successor doesn't start up the war again, that the costs would be so high that they wouldn't start the war again. What should cross that line in terms of unacceptable Chinese support for Russia's war? Oh, I think, I think any provision of actual weaponry to, to Russia would be a problem, mm -hmm. um, whether it's ammunition or um, uh, missiles, uh, you, know, you know, anything along those lines. We know that they're providing dual use things for Russia. They're doing, mm -hmm. they're providing them a lot of semiconductors. They're providing them with drones and, and things like that. And, but the Chinese are, have been very careful so far about what they've provided to the Russians so that they don't end up crossing our, our line on sanctions mm 
and getting the secondary sanctions imposed on But they're financially China. benefiting from this war. I think that it, I, I think there are both upsides and downsides mm -hmm. uh, for China in this. Uh, you know, you got the impression of this great uh, alliance or partnership without limits and so on uh, in terms of opposing the democracies and especially the United States. But, but I think Putin has gotten himself into trouble. And the truth is Russia is going to end up much weaker when this war stops than it was before it started. So, so Xi's partner has been significantly weakened by this war, and that's got to worry him as well. What do you make of this feuding that appears to be happening among Russian fighters? You had that video released by, the, by uh, Prigozhin, the head of the mercenary group, Wagner Group, really criticizing the defense minister of Russia, saying he's not giving me the ammunition and he's lying about the war. What's happening here? My view is this is all taking place with Putin's approval. A theater. This is, this is Putin dividing and conquering. Putin, given how badly the war has gone, has to worry at some point that his military decides he's a problem. By giving Prigozhin power and strengthening Prigozhin and letting him criticize the, de the Ministry of Defense, Putin keeps them divided. If the two came together and decided Putin was a problem, then Putin would have a really big problem. So my view is that, that Putin is sort of orchestrating this to a degree in the sense, or at least letting it go forward because it serves his interests in keeping these two powerful forces uh, at each other's throats rather than potentially beginning to collude against him. Because it's about his survival. It's all about his survival. I was looking at an interview you gave to Face the Nation back in 2014 to my colleague at the time. Um, and it was after Vladimir Putin had initially invaded that eastern portion of Ukraine. And you were talking about, well, the US doesn't really have a lot of leverage to stop Russia. You said, as far as I'm concerned, that's a done deal. Nothing we can do to change that situation. I heard a, l a few echoes of that in what you were talking about with how this war ends. Is your assessment that Crimea will have to stay with Russia, that the Donbass or large parts of it will have to stay with Russia? Is that what you're saying? I think in the, in, in, for the foreseeable future that uh, Crimea will be a heck of a reach for the Ukrainians. I, I don't think, I think that's going to be very, very difficult for them. The Russians are deeply entrenched there. They've spent the last, the whole winter preparing uh, for a counteroffensive in that area. And, and they are, they have to hold on to Crimea if for no other reason. Their huge naval base, uh, that's their only major naval base uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, but down the road, I can see an agreement in which, first of all, that where the first stage is, even if there's a ceasefire, where the U Ukrainians never concede and the West never acknowledges Russian sovereignty over Crimea. I can, and that's a situation similar to when Stalin seized the Baltic states, uh, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. We never recognized that those countries uh, were part of the Soviet Union but they had for 50 control. years. Right. So my, what I'm saying is I think you could have a situation where we never recognize that. And at some point down the road with a different kind of Russian government, you could have a negotiation fostered by the West in which for some price, uh, the Russians agree to vacate. Mm -hmm. uh, parts of Crimea or, you know, they're going to keep that naval base regardless. Mm -hmm. But I think you could have a negotiation m years from now after a ceasefire where Ukraine could get back those parts of Ukraine that Russia has occupied. But I think that's in the, in the pretty f distant future. Distant future, not in Vladimir Putin's lifetime. Probably not. Not in the next decade, potentially. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about something you said last year uh, when I was asking you about the state of the country. 
you said it would concern you if President Trump ran for office again. He is currently the front runner for the Republican nomination. What's your level of concern now? Well, I'm concerned because, uh, among other things, because he, is, he has been very clear that he wants to um, dramatically change, if not dismantle, some major institutions uh, in the American government. And, you know, my attitude for a long time has been many of the institutions in our government need dramatic reform. Mm -hmm. But those institutions are critical to the preservation of our democracy, pre preservation of our economic well-being, and frankly, uh, our freedom. And so the, my view is the, the platform should be these institutions need real reform. And so ideas on how do you reform them? How do you make them more responsive? How do you uh, make sure that there aren't people doing wrong things? Uh, In other words, don't defund the FBI, are you saying? I think defunding the FBI would be a right. crazy idea. But you're talking with a degree of nuance and understanding of the intricacies of government. That's just not where the rhetoric is. Oh, totally not. <laughs> so is your concern limited to that? I mean, it's, it's truly, you, you believe that the institutions of our democracy are at risk if Donald Trump gets reelected to the presidency? I'm just reading what he says. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's a, that's a very real risk. And that's just based on, again, what he says. Right. But he may be the nominee for the party. That's true. What does this next two-year period look like for us? Well, the, the interesting thing to me is the, is the polls that suggest that significant majorities of the American people across the board would rather have two very different candidates for president mm -hmm. than the choice they're likely to be given. And, and the question is, you know, it is a long time between now and November sure. of 2024, so who knows what will happen. But um, it, I think a lot of people are discomfited by that possible choice. Mm -hmm. Well, President Biden's 81 and Donald Trump is 76. Do you think that their age is an impediment um, or do you think that there's risk in crowding out, for example, the next generation? So, so when, when I did this interview with you all in 2016, mm -hmm. in May of 2016, I said then that I thought the two candidates were too old. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm basically Biden's age. And I said, you know, and this was five years ago, I said, my fastball isn't what it was. My energy level isn't what it was. Uh, I still think I'm pretty with it, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, here is this incredibly vibrant young country, uh, the United States of America, and, and these are the candidates that we're going to get. And I think young people in particular look at that and say, whoa, those people don't really represent what I, what I believe or the kind of modern approach to governance that, that I think we ought to have. I, I, think it, I think it discourages a lot of people. Discourages people from, from showing up to vote? Discourages well, people from entering government? Well, the voting has actually not been bad in the last few elections, but it, I think it discourages them about the prospects for getting at some of the problems that we talked about earlier, about how do you get past this paralysis? How do you get past this lack of civility? Maybe you need a new generation of people who have a different approach to dealing with others. Is there any glimmer of hope there that you see on the horizon or new talent? Well, I think, I think there, there is actually. I think there are several caucuses in the House in particular that, um, that are looking for ways to have more uh, pragmatic problem solving in Congress, to have more bipartisanship. Uh, there's, there's one caucus that's comprised almost entirely of former military, mm -hmm. people who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, the four country caucus that's yeah. now got two dozen members that basically to, to get the support, they have to agree to a number of steps in terms of 
cooperating on a bipartisan basis, and about half of them are Democrats and half are Republicans. And you've got several other caucuses along those lines. So yeah, those gives me those give me hope, and 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 I think, um, but I think I think it's got to start. We can't start solving some of these big problems until we have some restoration of civility and where people actually respect each other. Well, thank you for the civil conversation today, <laughs> Mr. Thank Secretary. You. Always my pleasure. Thank you.